an African-American woman was shot and killed by a white police officer while she was inside her own home. Four officers rushing to the scene. Two of them, you can see here, their weapons drawn, pointing at a young man in a wheelchair. Behavioral therapist was shot by an officer after he held his hands in the air, lying on the ground, his patient with autism sitting right nearby. Subject's down in the backyard. Yep, good. Uh, we, we have him secured it. Police never found a firearm, only a cell phone. Police brutality has been almost omnipresent in the past couple of decades, but even though protests have gotten increasingly larger and raised more awareness, it feels like not enough progress has been made towards finding justice for people affected by brutality. Officers who've used excessive force and are brought into court are usually let free nearly as soon as they're put on trial. This is all because of the doctrine of qualified immunity. It's a doctrine that gives law enforcement officials special protection in court that other citizens wouldn't have just because of their status. The only way a police officer would have this protection revoked would be if they violated a federal law or constitutional right and they were clearly aware that they were committing an unjustifiable violation. Because NYPD officer Daniel Pantelio said he didn't intend to kill Eric Garner when he strangled him to death in 2014, he was acquitted. But he isn't the only officer to have been set free despite his actions. According to Associate Professor of Criminal Justice Philip Stinson, only 80 officers were arrested for murder and manslaughter from 2005 to April of 2017, and of those 80, only 28 of them were ultimately convicted. The death of Eric Garner was one of the catalysts of the Black Lives Matter movement, along with the deaths of Michael Brown and Trayvon Martin, whose death initiated the movement. People around the country like Lisa Sarabella have banded together to fight for justice and the hope that the police institution will change its methods. I'm of the mindset that it's historical. So even though police are fearful, you know, afraid for their lives, maybe they're not always wearing a vest or maybe they know people in the street have guns and they may know some neighborhoods have more crime than others. That may all be very well and true, but I also think that it's like deeper and more profound, that it's just part of our history. Black men in particular are more policed People are more scared of them, cops are more scared of them. Being more policed is just part of our history in terms of how minorities were treated over generations and generations and generations after slavery, after Jim Crow. So I just, I think it's deeper than just people are afraid or cops are afraid. November 12th, 1984. To Thorne Graham begins having a diabetic reaction and doesn't have any medication for it. Thinking quickly, he asks his friend to drive him to a store to buy orange juice as a replacement. At the store, Graham realizes he can't wait in line long enough before succumbing to his reaction, so he leaves soon after going inside, empty-handed. An officer named M.S. Connor sees Graham leave and assume he must have stolen something. He chases after him, pulling him over. Graham gets out of the car, obviously fatigued due to medical reasons and not substance abuse. Connor still arrests him and calls for backup. Graham doesn't resist arrest after being handcuffed, but he's still slammed onto the hood of the car and is pinned against the ground. Graham leaves with multiple injuries, including a broken leg. Connor leaves without any harm to himself or his reputation. Because of this case, it was decided on May 21st, 1989, that any police officer can use as much force as they want as long as they perceive it to be necessary. But how do officers determine how much force to use, or when to use it? Officer John Martins of the Central Marin Police Authority had this to say. Every police officer is different, so we all use our authority differently. It comes down to knowing how to properly use that authority in any given situation. Citizens and officers ourselves hold law enforcement officers to a high standard, so we work to make sure each of us is using the power we have responsibly. The doctrine of qualified immunity is important to have, because a lot of times the only way to keep as many people safe as possible is to use force. You have to take into account the totality of the circumstances and consider why the officer chose to do what they did. 
There are a lot of officers who do take advantage of their immunity though, so it's important to always make sure that you really are qualified in any given situation to have the immunity that you do. From 2010 to 2016, nearly 400 people out of the 2,563 who were reported to have been shot by police were unarmed, and roughly 250 more people weren't certain to have had weapons or not. If the doctrine of qualified immunity were to be modified in order to give police officers a similar list of protections in court to average citizens, two things could occur. One of them is that police officers might not feel as though they're able to do their jobs effectively since they wouldn't feel as comfortable using weapons or physical force against people. But the other is that any victims or the loved ones of those victims would have an easier chance of finally finding justice. As Officer Martin said, an officer's best tool to use is their words. If an officer has to use force and there really aren't any other options, that's understandable, but hundreds of future victims of police brutality could be protected or avenged if the doctrine were to be modified.